The USFL is a new partner that will bring some exciting new players into the league. We also talk about a hot-button issue between the USFL and the NFL that it speaks of right now. And we have a sit-down interview with Jared Horton, defensive coordinator of the Pittsburgh Maulers. This is episode 34 of the USFL podcast, and it starts right now. One, two, three. Oh! to the latest edition of the USFL podcast. Zach Common sitting in here for the hosting duties for episode 34 alongside, of course, my good buddy, pal, comrade, partner in crime, name it, whatever you want to call it. It is the ref on the opposite side of me here on the screen. Welcome aboard, ref. We got some exciting, thrilling new stuff for the league. We, I didn't think we were going to be jumping on for an episode this quick, but here we are. We got to discuss some I know. stuff today, I mean, my friend. Who would have thunk it? A back-to-back week in, what are we in, October? Getting fun. You know, it is yeah. funny. It is a little funny because I will remember a while back in the speculations on when we came back, I said, I had mentioned, you know what? I have a feeling. I have a little jitter in my belly that feels like we're going to start getting some news in October. And October's here and news is coming. And I can't wait to talk about it. I Oh my gosh. I, I, I was very thrilled at this, this piece here. Um, and this partnership that we are going to discuss today, um, that I'll get into in just a moment for you folks that are tuning in, um, really good stuff. If you haven't, if you know, you know, by now, if not, and you're learning the first time, you should be excited to hear about what this, what this is. Um, but in the meantime, here's, we'll give you all the, all the beginning juicy bits that we always do at the beginning of these shows. Be sure to check us out on social media. Hey, We've been pretty active as of late, late all over the place, especially our twi- Twitter. Trust me, go at, at USFL Podcast, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter if you want to follow along. Not only for show releases, but also you know some good conversations following along with the league and what it has been doing. Also, you know, be sure to uh, while you're at it, not only follow our social platforms like that, but subscribe to the YouTube channel if you are. By the way, if you're tuning in for the first time, go down there, click that big red button, and then click the bell. And as we always say, it builds morale, not only for you, but for us too, because we get to have you join in with our little community, all talking the United States Football League. And while you're at it too, we are going to be still looking to give away a custom USFL jersey of your choice to one lucky winner. We are trying to hit 5,000 subs for sure going into season two of the USFL podcast. And you subscribing does put you automatically in for that giveaway. So don't go anywhere. Hang on to your sub. We are going to 5K and we are going to get there. We will be getting there. I guarantee it. Also, the answer is always yes. It, Let me just add that in. The answer is always yes. If you don't believe it, you better start believing it. We're not just hitting 5K. We're not just hitting 50K. One of these days, we're going to be a 500K. 500 million, I don't care. The answer is always yes. Sorry, Zach. I had to jump in with that one. Well, I I (laughs) always have to be, I have to be put in the right spot. You know, I can't, I can't leave it (laughs) undersold. That's what it is. Can't undersell it. But folks, we are going to be taking it up and up and stay along with us for the ride going into season two. It's only going to keep getting crazier. I mean, it's just October and we're getting some stuff already like this that impacts next year for you as well. Uh, Final little bit, and trust me, if you haven't checked these guys out, uh, what are you doing? Because they are a great partner with us. Uh, Royal Retros, who has been doing excellent work with USFL memorabilia, also other alt football memorabilia. If you want XFL, you want World League of American football, you want other, you want World League of football, just anything old school that is new, that then turned into new school football memorabilia wise or sports memorabilia wise. They do a great job and you can save 10% off by using USFL podcast on their website when you go to check out. Again, 10% off at Royal Retros, help support the show, help support Royal Retros, and you get some pretty sweet swag at the end of the day. I don't see the losing situation. And let's not in this forget, team. Zachy boy, holidays are coming up. You know what? If you have a spring football person in your life, I mean, they got they got the gifts that they're going to be digging under that Christmas tree this December. Oh, snapback yeah. hats, jerseys, 
they've got they've got awesome Letterman s type of type of jackets as well. These things are great looking. Uh, they are sleek. I've been debating on getting a Panthers one because it's that old new school. I would totally do it as my look for next season. I'm debating it hard. It's it'll manifest myself. I just gotta I'm going to get you that jersey. So here's the skinny. It's going to happen. I have a feeling I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'm not going to say I'm going to do it for sure, but I have a feeling I'm going to. And the good news is that'll give us that. that well, it, whether there's news or not, there will be an episode here in the near future, whether it's next week or the week after. We'll see. We'll see. But it is coming. All right. All right. I, sw- <laughs> I can't wait. I, I, I can't wait because I also get to show off the num the player I get have on the back and he'll be very he, he'll be very excited to see that mm-hmm. as well. I get to rep him. Awesome stuff. All right, guys, let's dive into it. Here's the skinny folks. Today, as as we are set give, setting this episode up, um it's kind of about eh, nine nine ish in the morning. You and I got a got a little bit of a uh, a news piece come down. Couldn't say anything up. about it. Little but, hey, something fun's yeah, it, coming, it guys. Up. But it was a good. It was it was a big eyebrow raiser. We we kind of like we were kind of like teasing, joking with our buddies on Pro Football Newsroom Discord. By the way, jump on there. We're almost at, we're like at the threshold. Of I know. Thousand members, by the way, that that's insane in its own right. But we waited till ten. We set something up on USFL Newsroom at ten. And a press release dropped at 10 that we were given. The USFL is now partnering in terms of scouting data, in terms of shared resources. They are working with Hub Football. Now, for you guys, you got for some of you maybe don't know what is Hub Football. Okay. Now, if you're a diehard in this space, you probably that name probably you are you're like us. You're going, oh, okay, that's awesome. For others, you might maybe going, hmm, how is this? How is this is exciting? Well, here's the deal. <laughs> Um, hub football is essentially, it's a structure of not only showcase camps, but it's also a place that is to help bring highlighting, help to bring and highlight the best of the best football players that are the diamond in the rough category of guys that are looking to be highlighted. They only bring in a certain amount of players per event that they do all year round across the country. And they not only provide you know, video footage to scouts in the NFL and the CFL and other various areas like the USFL, but they also provide the data from those events. They leave that readily available for you. They also have their own set of scouting talent that they can then provide resources for. And essentially the USFL and that and hub are partnering up to help create basically a pipeline Mm -hmm. for the league. I mean, so you are going to be getting essentially what the hub views is some of the best young talent. The USFL gets essentially first dibs to say, Hey, here's a bunch of data on these guys. We like these guys. They can advise them on, you know, how these guys could be impactful for rosters. And it makes things easier for these GMs and player personnel directors in the league that are still looking to fill out these rosters with the best of the best available. And hub has been proven that they can bring some of the best guys in the biz or that are, you know, needing that shot. Well, for sure. And I mean, that's the thing is they're no stranger to this game. They've worked with different spring leagues in the past and more specifically, they've worked with the USFL leading up to this. And I'll let you mention the names, but let's go over the numbers real quick. 52 members, 52 former hub football camp participants were signed during the XFL draft and made it to the season with another, another 18 coming throughout the season, 70 players total, almost Mm -hmm. two full USFL teams, right? When you think about that, almost two full teams coming from one single source in hub football. Now, Zach, I don't want to, because you were the one that brought up the names earlier, but for the, for the folks out there that maybe aren't, uh, you know, into the spring football scene as much as what Seth Lesson would call the crazies like you and I, mention the the two names that you had brought up while we were talking about this before the show. Yeah. Um, so in the press release, they actually list mm-hmm. Jamar Smith, who was a hub participant, but also Case Cookus was a hub participant as well. Think about this. The two championship quarterbacks were both from the hub. Um, other talents, as we're saying, are from the hub. So they already have been utilizing the hub to its full advantage. I think last year 
to me, this makes logical sense. Hey, why not take it a step further? You know, uh, I mean, they're already providing a massive amount of talent to the league. And if both of them are liking what the other's doing, it just fits like a glove. You know, again, they, they already are highlighting some great talents. They had some, they had several of them sign on those sides, get mm-hmm. signed on to the NFL via the USFL as well. So, and the hub's mission is to try and elevate players to their opportunity at another level. So why not add this on? It just, it, the layers on layers on layers of this for both sides make, oh, just make over, well beyond hundred percent. Well, and the sense. thing that I like about hub football right is it's it's it was kind of built from the ground up for this purpose but the 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 person behind it don ye i mean he's no slouch in yeah. the football game i mean that's a powerful name in the football right because business, he's folks. what tom brady's agent Dr- tom yep. brady jimmy garoppolo i mean he's other players but those are like yeah. these marquee guys he's He's built his career on eight on just free on just agency work alone. Well, it was funny too. It was almost like my two worlds colliding this morning. I know most people won't get this, but we joked on Discord earlier of uh, the the spokesman for Hub Football. I was like, this guy's everywhere. This guy's everywhere. <laughs> like I feel like other than the releases I get from the USFL, they all come from this other guy. I'm not gonna put them out there. Cause I don't know if they want to be, but my God, good no, I, sign him <laughs> up, man. I mean, get that work. I know. Right. <laughs> it's, it's, I, yeah. It's, it's hilarious. Cause I, I've had interact and I say hilarious because I've had interactions with him. Good, good gentleman. When I've interacted with him, cause I've had uh, interviews based on discussions with him uh, for the um, arena mm. football Alliance too. Um, but yeah, he's all over the place. He does a lot of PR related work. Um, Good stuff from him, him though. But I mean, seriously, the hub, they, they already have seemed to be embracing this partnership. You know, they, they were hinting at it early on. I think people, you know, it's not guaranteed that's what it is, but you know, when you kind of go, Hey, big things are coming, we might be helping our platform more. And, you know, it was just, it just kind of combined into this. So want to list a few things off from the press release, as always. You want to get some details and quotes, because I think some people's quotes you want to get highlighted and say, all right, maybe this adds a little bit of a nugget to this whole discussion. One person that we get to hear from, and again, you don't hear from him as much anymore since the league kind of started molding into more of a Fox property, but he still is very involved with the league every time I talk with folks with the league. Uh, Brian Woods, he gets listed in here with some quotes. Daryl Johnson has some, too. We'll get to those as well. Um, but let's, let's, let's read off the two that are in the press release here. So first things first quote, hub football will provide another scouting data resource to the innovative approach that we're taking to, with player personnel at the USFL. That's his first quote. Second quote, as a, the USFL prepares for season two and beyond, we're excited to officially partner with hub football to assist us with procuring elite young talent. Now hold that thought right there. That sounds mm-hmm. very familiar. If you remember one of our episodes before the season started, he went on and has actually talked with in well, really scout with and with other scouts. That is, um, with inside the inside the league as well. He was brought on for a special interview event with them. He's saying the same thing he was back in the day. They eventually want to be young oriented first. The guys that are dot, maybe they just missed their chance out of college and they need another window. He's hitting home on that again. That has been his word since day one. And here it is manifesting itself in this. And it makes sense with hub football. You need to be just out of, you need to be just out of high school for two years and you can be eligible for hub USFL. You also need just to have a minimum. I believe it's, if I remember right, it is just two years and then you can join in. So see the Mm -hmm. aligning, it's very much at a parallel between these, which you love to see. I mean, and it's always great to hear from the president, Brian Woods, because it is very, it's a little few and far between now, but here's the thing is he's getting things done in the background. That's the one thing that I think is, is what, what he excels at is this, the operational pieces, because I mean, we, we already know about the spring league. Now we have the USFL, but he's been involved in projects in the past, big and small, And I mean, getting these things together, getting these groups together again, for some, it might seem a little insignificant, but you are tying up a lot of top talent. And I think you brought this up earlier and getting first dibs on them. And I mean, the key, the key takeaway for me is 
All you need to look at is season one without a partnership. Almost two full teams, both of your championship quarterbacks, and now you have first dibs going in where you're already signing players. You're already prepping up for a draft coming early next year. I mean, yeah. realistically, uh, you know, I talked about this in the write-up that we did on Newsroom. You know, it, it's been a long, long time. Most people, it's the first time in their life that we're seeing a true second year for a spring football league, right? And, you know, going right. into that second season, it's it's really kind of hard to anticipate what we're going to see in the offseason. But if I were to say, these are the things that you need to do to build and expand and grow what you already have, these would be the types of things that I would have in my list. And, I mean, like I said, when there there's, there's a lot of operations similar to Hub Football, but when we get down to the nitty gritty, the the meat and potatoes of it, I'd say it's hard to say that hub football isn't the best option. I mean, when it comes to that, right? Like they have it definitely well, makes they, I mean, case. they have not just a year or two, they have a couple of years of experience doing this. We've already seen it work last year. Might as well expand upon that partnership. It seems like it was working. I mean, it's great publicity for hub football now, too. That they could say, hey, look, oh, yes. we are growing stars because we have people going to the NFL. We have people also going to the USFL, and I'm sure the CFL as well, right? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I I love this entire setup for that. And, yes, of football, you know, without a doubt, it is definitely one of, if not the marquee go-to, I think, in terms of just having, I think, at least curated events, ones that's like, you know, they do their own scout, scouting of these guys and they get in invites and get registered and then they are brought in. So they they know right away that these are people they want to see at these events that are they consider top guys that should get another shot and that you're like, hey, you might want to take mm -hmm. a look at these people, you know, and keep in mind, Hub has its own its own massive coaching staff in its own right. I mean, we're talking guys mm -hmm. like Seneca Wallace, you know, he, he was played an extensive NFL career. You know, he's actually their hub quarterback coach. So he works with the QBs out, out there as well. Al, as, 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 as Zahir Hakeem, who I've definitely heard that name in the NFL mm. as well, you know, familiar to some, receiving a receiving court, coach there for the hub football setup as well. Uh, other guys that have been mentioned as well, you know, you have Wayne Moses, who's for the running backs. Um, speaking of running backs as well, Kirby mm -hmm. Wilson's been involved with these events, by the way. So someone in our own Discord brought that up as a theory uh, before this got announced. I believe it was one of the guys uh, that's in USFL mm -hmm. Network who's in there that brought that up, which praised them again for, for, that, for that one because it's just hilarious. That was like right, two right, days right. ago. Yeah, it, it is interesting Two to see ago, that. And now, you know, I, we won't do a full speculation zone, but I'll do a mini speculation zone. I wonder if we see that missing New Orleans breaker head coach somewhere in the mix over at Hub already. If Kirby Wilson's involved, maybe there's another one that we don't know about. Purely speculation zone. I don't know if I think or know that's the case, but I'll throw it in there because, Zach, if I'm right, it's always fun to... to throw back and be like hey look at that weird wacky thing i said happened you know <laughs> right right absolutely absolutely i i just it's hilarious how that how that worked out you, you, you but in a good way in the best way possible i can keep going down the list of other coaches by the way that are in this that you would recognize uh defensive line linebackers coach marvin jones Derek gardner who's defensive backs coach for hub uh nick novak is in this he does mm -hmm. kicking and punting so very familiar name because he's been doing special events right. uh, for the XFL. So he'll also be contributing his own stuff with the USFL here with Hub Football. There's, a, like I said, it's a plethora of guys that have league experience. Mm -hmm. They they know what they're doing. And with the, and Don Yee set this up because I mean again he's an agent. He knows what's needed for the NFL and these other leagues. This is set up for the benefit of the players, and it only helps with the USFL adding this on as well. And actually, Don Yee has a few quotes here. In this press release that I'll read off from the Hub Football side here, quote, the path to pro football has needed inno innovation for a long time, and together with the USFL, we're excited to offer all aspiring pro players an alternative path to the USFL and beyond, end quote. Next quote, this partnership is just the first step towards creating a unique discovery opportunity for the best of the next generation of football talent. The discovery opportunity is implying as what we've talked mm -hmm. about, the data sharing partnership. 
and essentially saying, hey, this is what we've got for you. Take a look. We recommend you check these guys out, you know, or it's an advisory setup. So clearly he's thinking in mind again. It's about the players for his side of it. The USFL, it's also been the message for this whole time. It's player right. first driven. It's been that way for both sides. Mm-hmm. It just makes sense. I mean, this is awesome. And, you know, the, we also have some more quotes. Now, this is one we hear more from more often. And I believe we even saw the USFL comms Twitter account post again today with. They did. Yeah. They I mean, keep posting. Hey, making it happen. We're willing it to life here. I'm enjoying it. But we heard from Executive Vice President Daryl Moose Johnson, which we do hear from pretty frequently. In fact, you know, I was actually watching uh, NFL football. I don't want to either this past weekend or the weekend previous. And when he was on the broadcast, he had mentioned the USFL and uh, some of the journeys coming through. And I'm like, ah, man, you just love to hear that. Right. Uh, Get you get you a man that can run that can help run a league. And also can broadcast on Sundays. Oh, for Johnson, sure. Well, I mean, maybe. even because I, you know, I put myself through hell watching all the Lions games, but Maurice uh, Alexander was in there and they brought up his journey through the USFL. So, man, I just love to see that. But anyway, bringing our focus back, here's what Daryl Johnston had to say about the new partnership. USFL fans enjoyed entertaining and competitive football during our first season because we invested heavily in finding and developing the best players. So that's the end of the quote there. This scouting data partnership with Hub Football continues the USFL's fan-first, player-driven focus and is another step towards what is going to be an exciting season two. And I mean, now we've heard it in a couple of these quotes. Season two, and then more importantly from Brian Woods, season two and beyond. Season two and Mm -hmm. beyond, right? I mean, the Band-Aid's off. We're already through season one. Anything that could have gone wrong, and I'll knock on wood, went wrong, right? And there wasn't much. I mean, there was probably some issues with the drones, I think, at first, but all of that got sorted. It's all kind of still experimental. Now we're going into season two. We we can fondly look back on what Daryl Johnston said before the first season. Hey, season one, we just need to get through it. We need to get on the ground, make right. it from goalpost to goalpost, have a championship game and then build from there. Here's the building from there. Mm -hmm. Season three, I'm excited, right? We're not even to season two. I'm excited to see where that evolution goes, right? Because we have the hubs this year. We have these partnerships. Is season three going to be all the hubs? Is it going to be expansion with maybe some more hubs? It looks like they're working on whatever they need to work on with the and beyond. Maybe I'm reading too much into it, but I love to hear it. Well, no, I, I, I don't think you're too far off saying because they, they know they know what they got to do in the first three years, I think, to try and secure the league's fu- to secure the league's future, of course. Everyone's talked about, especially the locations. I mean, the, this hub news is awesome. Um, people are excited and are getting, we're getting a little bit more on, uh, I guess, in a way, the talks on how the locations are going right now. Um, I, all I, can, I mean, the most we can put is actually our our good buddy Roy Johnson right having a write up on it, where it sounds like it's kind of when and the league said this too to us that all options are being discussed and everything, but it really is like all options, at least according to what he's heard, are being discussed. So um, we'll find out, you know. But I mean, they want the best scenario for not only fan engagement, but also to continue the great football product and broadcasting product that they had last season. You know, you want to have those same innovations back and maybe even more some because they're I think these both these entities are looking at this as, you know, we got to do something different. Let's keep pushing the envelope right. a little bit if we can, you know, and that's going to be part of this whole conversation. But right now, I, I do <laughs> think in terms of the hub football co- discussion here definitely is an it's just an excellent bit of news because it shows the development of the league again getting more people together getting more minds in the room to help make a good football product and to give players more opportunity because again you want to advertise the usfl to to players going to the usfl that hey this is the best avenue for you to get what you need to get to that next level we are developing talent we are showing off talent and we are showing a good football product three core pillars right there i what you have a great avenue right. to go to 
and that just adds. Well, you can also add on. You can Especially also add on. Fun. You know, you know, we might not play in all of our cities yet, but our teams do have names. So I mean, there's that going for you yeah. as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, they do. I can, I can wear. I wore my, I wore my Michigan Panthers shirt last night. I would have worn it on here, but I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> give that away i got the use one that's clean right now is all i'm telling you but <laughs> seriously at least we got a name <laughs> at least we got names that's that's true you know i had to throw it in there i don't know why i do it i can't control myself so well, it, look it look look it's we we as you folks know we follow all the leagues people talk about it so it's kind of like this running gag at this point until it actually happens is hey <laughs> is this is a league yeah, with no name i know <laughs> I hope it's not my fault. I don't know. If you don't know what I'm talking about, watch last week's episode. (laughs) Yeah, sorry. No official names. I'm pretty sure we know the names are thanks to you, good sir, but no official names Uh, on their end. We still have to wait on that. It's all. You know know what's one thing we haven't talked about on this show in probably too long? Colin Coward. I don't know how he fell off the radar so much. There was like a weekly thing for us. If I, I hear some of you, I hear some of you <laughs> trying to hit pause right now on the audio or video. Stop! Don't leave. There's a good combo here. I, I just hold <laughs> on with us. We we ain't gonna give you too much of the. Of I don't the herd, understand okay? why people dislike the herd so much. He's all right, but you know what? I bet you he ain't talking about Baker Mayfield that much anymore. Well, it's definitely not Baker Mayfield, related, so you can definitely wipe your brow. And this is a good. This is a really good combo. Seriously, seriously, I'm not and. You know, Colin has great has some, has some great segments that I that we've seen recently. Uh, this one's this one is you know it seems a little simplistic because it's my because Mike Pereira he comes on quite often, um, but it does have great insight to I think highlighting one of the strengths that the league has in terms of being an alternative option and maybe pushing the game forward a little bit, uh, especially if you've been watching NFL games lately. Uh, this past week definitely has had some people get a little. Uh, bit of boiling blood in them uh from a few play mm-hmm. from a few rulings we'll get into uh would you like to uh, explain what we're well, discussing y- you know zach i'll be honest you're probably the better expert at this but i'm gonna i'm gonna jump into it with what i know right so i'll be honest i watch okay. probably more spring football and alternative football than nfl i do torture myself with lions games but i don't know if you necessarily call that football all the time <laughs> So essentially what, what Mike Pereira came on to the herd to talk about was the, what seemingly uh, uh, the increase in questionable NFL roughing the passer calls that we're seeing. And I mean, we, we were kind of talking about this last week, not necessarily in this context, but we had brought up the Brady rule with, uh, you know, one of the players coming to the league and kind of made that comparison. Yep. Uh, and like you had mentioned, Zach, there was one over the, the past week that I think maybe raised some eyebrows and we're seeing more and more of it to talk about this. And you know what? The great part of it is, and you, you confirmed and attested this during Pereira's appearance, he specifically brought up, you know, in the USFL, you, you can, you can question those types of things. In fact, I mean, he even re- reversed a flag during the playoff game between the generals and the stars. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. What is your whole take on this? I feel like this is putting the X, uh, the USFL in some good light here because I mean, they've created a, a different approach that seems to work for both the players, the coaches and the fans. And now I don't know. Will we see yes. this adopted? I'm curious to get your take on all this. <laughs> Well, I'll get I'll get to that for sure because Pereira is also he touches on the adoption part of it. Um, first things first, similar deal with Mike. I I had a sim, I had a say I had a tweet as well that I put out going the the replay of a personal fouls really looks good right now uh, for the USFL because they they just executed it to me ideally. And you'll hear this when we have our interview coming up later on with Jaron Horton. Um, it was efficient. It was quick. The rulings made sense. And Mike Pereira was able to get that in and out. And it didn't, it changed the game for the better in terms of keeping it in the hands of whoever's side it is and whoever mm-hmm. didn't commit the foul. And, it, you know, good rulings, sound rulings that I thought were breaking down why it was being made and having some parameters. The So Mike goes on to the herd and they discuss about recent calls. Now, 
what recent calls in particular? Well, there's two of them that people are really talking about that are, I think, making people kind of sweat a little and honestly say, what are we doing in terms of uh, violent hits? Because there, there's a two-way street right now. You have, of course, the conversation on Tua with mm-hmm. the concussion protocol. And now you have, of course, the roughing the passer calls. I feel like these are kind of hand in hand, except there's ways you can separate both. And essentially, Tom Brady got sacked by Grady Jarrett late in the fourth quarter. That would have given the Falcons one more drive. The Atlanta was down by six. They had come back from behind, and it was a pretty standard sack. Usual stuff. You get It's a wrap-up that Jarrett has. And to get him down, he kind of swings him around a little bit and brings him to the ground. No head injury, no head hitting the turf. It's a pretty typical sack, roughing the passer calls thrown. And it really made a lot of people's blood boil. It actually made me extremely frustrated. I go to one specific bar Mm -hmm. to watch my Bears games in Indianapolis, uh, Fat Dan Chicago Style Deli. I got to shout you out here because you, you guys are amazing. And I screamed louder at that play than I did in the entire Bears Vikings game. It was that egregious because right. it affects football. It it affects the sport in general and how you rule it. So when you know between that, between David between us uh, not David, Derek Carr, you know, being brought down after he gets his ball, mm-hmm. his pass tipped and being called roughing the passer, which shouldn't happen by the way, right. because the pass is dead. That's the other reason. You know, it, it just kind of brings that conversation to light. And so Mike Pereira comes on the herd. They have to discuss it because Mike's there. The, the, Mike's Fox's main rule guy besides mm-hmm. Dean Blandino. Um, and of course, he is the head of officiating for the USFL. And he brought up the point that, you know, they get to challenge this in the in the USFL. And specifically, that stars, that general stars game, because the play in particular, if you guys remember, earlier on in the first half, it's an interception that the stars have that's brought back for 80 yards. You know, Luis Perez takes a hard hit on that throw. It's ruled a roughing the passer call. They go back and they change that play to to the call not being on the field because of some of the parameters. The defender holds up. He tries to brace himself. He's not driving into the ground. Definitive parameters for these calls, it makes sense to the viewer. And the stars get an interception that should stay an interception. And he points that the NFL maybe wants to look at this. Thing is, right. it's the NFL. They are not great at adapting new ideas and technologies as, uh, as quickly as alt leagues. Alt mm-hmm. leagues have a little more freedom. The NFL kind of looks at, well, for the most part, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We have the largest sports property in America and one of the largest sports properties in the world. Right. It's slow going. If mm-hmm. you can build more evidence and make owners comfortable, great. But... Mike even says himself, it's not likely it gets adopted right away or even in near future, in a a near reasonable future. But honestly, that conversation should continue. The league is driving a great Mm -hmm. convo right now. And with, you know, the USFL getting NFL referees trained, I mean, you got to imagine that they get to say, hey, you know, this does kind of hold us liable, but it, they were able to do this in an efficient manner. It was ruled right. We get less bad blood because we have somebody keeping us accountable. It makes the system look better. I think that's it. Just it, mm-hmm. it enhances the conversation. Oh, of what for we're sure. Saying. So it ties in everything from this. Well, past that's. Week. I mean, that's the great thing about spring leagues. It, it does. You know, they're experimenting to kind of find their their rhythm. But at the same time, especially now that we're going into a season two and beyond, we'll say. Right. Uh, I mean, this yes. gives the NFL a, a, a way to really kind of see these test these things test out, play out without having to do it themselves. So, yeah, maybe it's not right now and maybe it's not right away. But, it, you know, like you mentioned, starting that conversation, maybe it expedites it. Maybe we see it. I mean, we'll never know, yeah. but maybe we see maybe. it five years sooner than we would have because maybe they have three years of footage that they can draw back with the USFL and see. How many times did it come into play? How many times was it reversed? How many times should it have been reversed? And so on and so forth. And again, without having to take up their time in the field. Although, although, I think the NFL should use their preseasons a little bit more wisely. And I know they they have done rule testing in the preseasons, but this feels like one of them. Or, you know, some of those other pieces that you could test out in the preseason 
where, you know, the game's on the line, but it's not on the line as far as your playoff contentions go and your regular season records. Right. They've done it. And look, they've done this stuff before. They've tested stuff in preseason without having ramifications for the regular season. That's kind of what the preseason is there for besides player eval and fine tuning for your roster. You can use that to do it that way. So I personally would love to see it, you know, and Mike doesn't mention just that rule. He mentions the sky just concept, which is the main component to this maybe adaption of this ruling and how Mm. they review. Because the NFL has been dragging its feet on the Sky Judge. It's been brought up after the AAF. It was used in the XFL. It's used again in the USFL. There's enough evidence over the last three plus years to say this mm. works. Which to me at this point, if you have three different leagues and you know, you're going to have two of them that will currently be using that format, at least that I'm aware of, it'll be two. I don't see why it won't be in the XFL. Right. The USFL definitely is, and it's going to use it effectively like it did last year in my opinion why don't you take a look they have a command center in new york that they help use for replays already why not just have someone that is a higher up official in that department run it like mike Pereira and be there for at least Mm -hmm. certain games or just be there where you have and you sign a few of them i know the nfl's got way more games than any other than the any of these alt leagues But you can get some people that are assigned to specific games. You can do this. You Mm -hmm. can make the game better. You know, it's just like I I brought it. I bring this up because I love the quote, even though it's from a movie that to me I've heard is horrible Mm -hmm. in terms of the story. Life's good. Well, here's the thing. Having more penalties doesn't necessarily make the game safer. Case in point, Tua, right? Right. Things are Mm going to happen. I think intent plays a good part in some of these things. And, you know, there's there's a difference between doing like going out of your way to rough the passer. Right. When I think of roughing the passer, I think of some of these hits from when I was a kid where you're like, oh, my God, that guy may never throw again. But then they (laughs) come out and they're whatever. Well, well, you will talk. We'll just think about this. You know, it's been you've been seeing what's going around with uh, the Tom Hmm. Brady hit the other side of the coin. They're bringing up that hit from uh, 2001 where he's playing the Bills. He's running out to his right, doing a QB, doing just basically a QB run. And basically what is an illegal hit now? You can't launch yourself into a player. And he took a, he took a massive hit from a player launching themselves like 200 plus Mm -hmm. pound linebacker. And today he gets, and today he draws flags for being sacked in a norm, one of the most normal ways possible. That's how much the game's changed. But I mean, there's been plenty of research in that. It's just, it's incredible to think, you know, that it's come to regular tackles that have become even suspect. Right. And I know point. that's the unfortunate piece about all this, but you know, I get it. There's a safety element. In it. You want to get in there. I mean, especially right now after the Tua thing, you know, they're probably like, I get why they might be throwing those rough in the pit. They don't want another incident like that to happen. Now I, it's, again, part of it falls on the league with Tua. I say a lot of it falls on that Miami ownership group the staff i i mean mm-hmm. i i'm not one to call for investigations because i don't know if it's ever going to lead to anything but we it feels like something 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 got missed in that whole process but we're getting off track now yeah i, I yeah let's maybe i'll bring back yeah. the ship towards more usfl discussion no, but, but but look if you if you're an nfl fan that likes the, this league too mm-hmm. this is why this is brought up you know, this is part of the reason why alt leagues are awesome for the fan side of it. You know, I th- it, I think to me it helps the greater good of the sport when you can experiment on the other side of this. The NFL gets a win because they have people that are experimenting on these rules and are working. You know, the USFL worked closely with the NFL mm-hmm. for their rule book. You know, they already get they keep an eye on them for their officiating. They know what's going on. They can see that these positive gains going on. And if a league stays around and keeps on getting more traction and keeps saying and showing people, hey, there's maybe a better way here, that only opens the book for the NFL. They are very much, they want a proven thing. They want certainty. All their owners want it to where it doesn't affect the game that much and that, you know, they can execute it without causing a ruckus or a stir. And I think we're coming close to that. Last year, I thought, you know, there were maybe maybe one or two moments I thought where the, where the sky judge system with Mike Pereira 
had some some su- suspect rulings. I know Joe Klatt, mm-hmm. you know, being his great banter with Mike back and forth, which made the broadcast to me just that much better. Getting to be like, "Hey, right. why did you do this?" You know, and it, it was it, the tension was awesome. I loved it, but overall, the rule, the callings, the understandings of the rulings, it makes it that much better. It makes it transparent, mm-hmm. which fans love, and no one looks like the bad guy to me at the end of the day. Really, you know. But if right. you can you can try, but I think that you have less of a chance pinpointing like, yeah, this ref screwed us over. You know, it, it obviously he just had an agenda. No, that 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 removes it completely. You understand sure. why these were made for sure. You know, even if you are a diehard fan of the team that does get screwed over by a call, well, you know, you know, you at least feel and understand why sure. they. Did you know, this, it's an interesting you know? take on it too, because like. Think about kids watching football. I mean, this it, it also makes it easier for them to learn the game, kind of the ins and outs of it, where, you know, the NFL, you're going to pick it up for a while after a while. But having mm-hmm. I love hearing the refs banter back and forth and getting like, well, no, yes. if this happened, that would be the case. But this happened then this is the case. And then, you know, the study, the footage you really get in depth where you're normally just watching them on a screen right now. You're getting getting the full scope of things. No more tomfoolery in the, in the, you know, you can, almost can't have it. They're mic'd up. We would know if they're up to, like, again, I'm a Lions fan. I have this sneaky suspicion that the refs, I don't know what it is, but they don't like the Lions. Well, they couldn't do that in the USFL because yep. I would know yeah. right away. I, I always feel bad when I have some Bears fans will come and be like, yeah, the refs are out to get us. I'm like, eh, I mean, there's a team up. There's a team just east of us that definitely gets it harder. I'll never than forgive us. them. I will never forgive them for that playoff game against the Cowboys. No, oh never. That one, that one definitely doesn't deserve any sympathy. Anyway, blatant, blatant anyway. pass interference. So it's face guarding. It's face Let's guarding. move topics here. A- anyway, folks, we, we got another we got another juicy part of this show that I was really happy came together so quickly. Um, actually, came. I'll, I'll say it right away. This, this came from some praise that, that we gave for the Maulers, uh, just mm. for free agent signing. So, um, kind of out of the kind of out of the blue type of deal. But I'm happy we were able to put this together and make an excellent piece. Uh, we're going to let you guys listen in to a one-on-one conversation I was able to have with defensive coordinator Jaron Horton of the Pittsburgh Maulers. You might know from our last episode, the Maulers, they're pretty busy right now in uh, free agency. Lonnie Young, he stepped in, and uh, things have been really cooking up over there at the Maulers camp with Wilson and Horton and company running the show. And uh, Horton's got a few thoughts on that, along with some of those uh, rule discussions we just had, too, and what lies ahead for the league itself. Take a listen right now. Welcome on in, everybody, into another edition of the USFL podcast, a new edition of our interview series. It's been a little bit since we have had an interview one-on-one with someone that is involved with the league, player, coach, otherwise. This time around, we are going to be bringing in a defensive coordinator who, you know, I think really shedded some has shed some of the potential light on avenues for coaching movement in the alt football space and has also made his presence known on the Pittsburgh Mars. It is defensive coordinator, Jaron Horton joining us today on this one-on-one series for the USFL podcast. Jaron, Hey, welcome on in. Uh, hope the off season's going well. You got a little bit of time to rest and relax, but it uh, looks like your team's making some moves. Yeah. Um, we've been pretty active in free agency as, as I think you guys can see if you've been following um, and it kind of just, we want to, create the 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 best team that we possibly can uh create a competitive environment when it comes to starting camp in uh in february or uh, march i believe um when when camp starts we want to have the best roster that we possibly can have as much depth as we can at, at every position so so there's competition and and guys can really earn their spot on the field and and i mean just because you were a starter last year doesn't mean you're going to be a starter this year. Just because you were on the team last year doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make the team this year. Um, I think that's it's it's professional football, and, and that's what we're trying to create the environment of is just be a pro, and and your spot's going to be up for grabs because someone else might take it. They're hungry too, so that's that's what we're trying to trying to make right now. 
is the name of the game for sure. And in the football space, as we all know, uh, very aggressive, very aggressive and very much, uh, got to take your shots when you can, um, for you guys, for the Maulers, you're going to be given plenty of shots so far. It seems, uh, GM player personnel director, Lonnie young. I mean, it seems like he's been the talk of the town and a lot of the USFL circles. Uh, the signing numbers have been ridiculous. Uh, if anything, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this. It feels like you guys are just saying, you know what? We're going to take, we saw what happened last season. We just want to get, and you stressed it, the best core group to kind of right the ship and kind of, I guess, maybe wash the bad taste out of your mouth from 2022. Yeah. So um, I've been working really closely with Lonnie, um, been working with Kirby, been working with JT, uh, Coach Thomason, our offensive coordinator. We've we've kind of been um, getting together on defensive signings, offensive signings, trying to to figure out what we see as a team. Um, I'm I'm talking with JT and Lonnie about what type of offensive players give me trouble, what type of guys do I not like to see, so we can get those guys on our team to kind of make our team better, um, and. Lonnie has stepped in because uh, Chris Watt, he he took a job with the Pittsburgh Steelers, which is mm-hmm. awesome. Like, oh, yeah. he's, he's a great dude and happy for him to, to take that next step. Um, but Lonnie has come in, and and I, I think the first day that he took the job, I, I had a conversation with him on the phone for about an hour. And uh, he was with the, the Baltimore Ravens for a long time, and, and I'm – I guess I grew up in the Pittsburgh Steelers um, kind of franchise, the tree, the whatever you want to call it. Coach LeBeau is a mentor for me, Coach Tomlin mm-hmm. as well. So the Ravens and the Steelers, although bitter, bitter rivals, there's there's a, a really high degree of respect um, between those two franchises. And if if you look at them through the years, they build the same way. Um, on defense, especially uh, three, four structure. Mm-hmm. They want to get athletic DBs that can cover safeties. They had Ed Reed, Pittsburgh had Troy Palomalu. I know different type of guys, but both hall of fame safeties. Um, two of the probably one and two of all time safeties. Okay. Um, and with that being said, me and Lonnie have a, a very similar idea, I guess of um what we want this defense to look like and what we're looking for um, because we're kind of looking for the same type of players that the Steelers and the Ravens and, and those type of three, four schemes um, are looking for. We want corners that can, that can play man coverage and that you can kind of just put on an Island out there. Um, I mean, Ike Taylor was, was a guy for the Steelers for a long time. And I mean, now you see in Baltimore, they got uh, Marlon Humphrey and um, Marcus Peters guys that can play man coverage um as safety you want smart guys um that can that can be the quarterback of the defense for lack of a better term I mean we were blessed in with the Maulers to have two of those guys last year with Bryce Torndin and uh uh Trey Tarpley both those guys are extremely extremely bright football players um and and picked it up very quick um but yeah I mean we're we're signing a lot of guys, um, some trying to replace guys that may not be coming back, whether that's they're not coming back, not signing for year two for the USFL or um, on defense. We were blessed to have a lot of guys go to the NFL. Um, that's true, too. which, yeah, is, is a is a kind of issue, but is is great because that's exactly what you want. This is a, a developmental league and we want we want these guys to go to the NFL and take the next step right now. We got uh Carlo is with the chargers right now. And uh, Jeremiah is with the, with the Patriots right now. And um, it's great. I mean, like I'm, I'm so, so happy that this league was able to give these guys the avenue to, to, to get film to now make it to the league. Cause for those two guys in particular, Carlo, he played three technique at Michigan. He was, 285 290 probably when he was in college um and he transitioned to outside line, linebacker for us um and he he had no film at that so 
maybe he would have got a shot in the NFL without the USFL, but probably not because no one's ever seen him play outside linebacker until this spring. So for a guy like that, I think that that almost is what epitomizes the league. Um, and Jeremiah came from a small school and, and you could kind of tell his growth throughout the league or throughout the season from camp to week one to the end of the season. It was like, at first he was kind of like, okay, do I belong here? Do I belong at this level? And then you kind of saw him grow and probably week two, week three, week four, he was like, not only do I belong, I'm one of the, one of the best players and I can, I can now step up to the next level. Um, and I think those two guys are, are guys that kind of epitomize what this league wants to be as a developmental league to, to get these guys opportunities to compete um, at a professional level, at a level that it's, it's, it's not the NFL talent wise, but there are NFL players on our rosters on, in the USFL. There are guys that can that can take that next step. Right. Gets to highlight some of those people. We, we, you know, diamonds, gems in the rough you know, some people that maybe needed a little extra time or film or coaching. And I mean, Carl Kemp, I think I love that you brought that example up. Cause I mean, we talk about the shots. We talk about, you know, take your opportunities where you can, you know, what, because what do you got to lose? Sometimes you never know. I, and I think that that just epitomizes just the, one of the greatest benefits of an alternative spring or a spring league is saying, okay, you know, this is my, ne- I have that next, I have that step here that I can, still show myself I can still play I can still enjoy the game I love and I can take those shots if I need to you know on the on the flip side of that coin really great story and I imagine for you you probably have to feel some pride I know it's a full defensive staff you you run but you probably have to feel some pride knowing that you had so many of your guys like you were saying being able to say hey I got these guys I I was able to run a really good unit and seeing that there was I obviously knew there's talent here they went up there. Yeah, they might not be back, but that's got to be a, a little bit of a token I can take with me, you know, helping a young man get their dream jump yeah. started again. Yeah, of course. And like I said, it like you said, we have a full defensive staff coach hole with the linebackers. Coach Nudo was working with the DBs. He's now at uh, East Carolina and coach Courtright uh, with the D line. Um, all those guys are awesome. And they, they work their work their butts off to, to help the players achieve what they want to. Um, but yeah, I, I'm certainly proud of being able to allow those guys the avenue to get to what they want to do. Um, as far as last year in January, February, Coach Curb gave me full control of who we were drafting on defense. So nice. Um, talking with the defensive staff, we put together a list of guys that we liked, and a lot of those guys we we were able to to get. Um, we actually early in the season encountered a lot of injuries on defense. Like mm-hmm. we, we thought we were really, really deep at nickel, but after week two, I think we lost our top three nickels. Um, so that was something that we had to kind of adjust and adapt to, um, which we were able to do pretty well, but it kind of just goes back to, we, we, I think we did a pretty good job of, of scouting, um, the guys that were in the draft pool to, to see who fits our scheme, because that's, that's probably the biggest part. If you have a bunch of guys that are talented, but they don't fit your scheme, then you can either bang your head against the wall, running a scheme that doesn't fit your players, or you can adapt the scheme to what your players are. We were blessed to have the ability to, to draft who we wanted to um, of guys that would fit into our scheme because I mean, we're running an NFL defense as far as nomenclature, as far as how things are working, um, coverage elements, stunts, blitz patterns. It's it's an NFL defense. Um, A little adaptation from the college game because things are starting to kind of spread out a little bit more and become more college-esque if you want to say that like spread more read elements and offense so you have to adapt a little bit to that it's not it's not as much 21 personnel power you're not getting that you're getting more mm-hmm. 11 10 12 personnel um still some of the same concepts but it's, it's just a little different so we have to adapt on defense as well 
I imagine spacing is probably a nightmare for you with modern offenses becoming just more about, all right, get your guys one-on-one, get your guys with that first or second cut if you can, get away from the gang tackles if possible or any possibilities of getting arms. That probably, I mean, how do you, what do you, what do you game plan? I mean, you're talking about adapting to a modern modern defense and you obviously, you play the position, your family is well acquainted to defensive back backs mm-hmm. and secondary of course uh, your father being Roy Horton that is so I mean what's what's an adaption that you look at for more of a wide out concept offenses are going towards yeah so um you can you can do a little bit as far as coverage scheme um a big thing that I learned um, in the college game and really with coach Mason, uh, coach Derek Mason at, uh, Vanderbilt when I was with him is like palms defense, um, kind of read two, I guess. Um, but most notably it's called palms where the corner's reading one and two, if two is going out, um, anywhere under seven, eight, sometimes people say five, but seven yards, give or take, if number two goes out, the corner is going to jump him and the safety is going to get over the top of one. Um, that allows a nickel to kind of play in between the receiver number two and the end man on the line of scrimmage, allow him to be that extra fitter for the run game. Um, and allows you to still have zone type coverage outside. Um, that's what a lot of colleges run now. It's, it's not as easy in the NFL. It's a little bit more difficult just because the quarterback talent is that much higher where, um, it's, it's hard to leave a slot receiver uncovered, like to allow him to have a free release because you get Patrick Mahomes, you get Josh Allen, you get those guys, they're going to, they're going to torch you. And you got Devonte Adams in the slot and all these guys that are extremely talented. So it's a little bit tougher in the NFL game, in the college game and in the USFL where you don't have Josh Allen, you don't have Patrick Mahomes, you don't have those elite, elite quarterbacks. You can get away with a little bit more of that. Um, but one thing that I've learned, like like you said, my, my father, Ray Horton, um, Ray. coached for the Steelers for a long time, um, coordinator in the NFL and, and whatnot. But growing up around football and around really the Steelers when they were mid-2000s winning Super Bowls and the number one defense for – three years in a row, stuff like that, of just sitting at practice. And I was a ball boy when I was growing up, so I was always around. And just seeing guys like Ike Taylor, Troy Polamalu, Deshae Townsend, guys that are professional and really, really good. Um, One thing that Ike Taylor said that has stuck with me is someone asked him what receivers don't like. And he was like, well, they like space. They, they right. want to be in space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get up in their face and press and not allow them to have space. So that's something I 1000% believe in. I like press. I like tight coverage. And I like man. If you can play corner and you can play man coverage and, and play press man, then I can let you go do your thing over there and we can do whatever we want with the rest of the defense. I think that is the biggest thing that you can do as a corner is, is the ability to play tight man coverage. I see a lot of guys now in, in high school and college playing like off man with their, with their butt to the sideline and shuffling. I don't like mm-hmm. that personally. Can it work? Yeah, it can. But that's not my style of defense. I want tight coverage and I want man. I want you up in the receiver's face because they want space. I want to take away what they want. And especially when they're spreading everything out and, and they want to get the ball in space, I want to make the quarterback throw into a tight window. That's that's really what what I see is on defense of trying to take away the uh, the spread game. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I, it's funny. I, I'm kind of on in my own personal beliefs on def, on how I look at defense. I'm kind of with you um, very much. I'm a fan more of the jam at the line type of play, player mm-hmm. rather than playing off on a cushion. I understand the cushion is, you know, you're you're just in case preparing. If you have him down below, you can have that leverage if he maybe he cuts in or maybe you're ready for 
keeping up with speed if it's a say a you know a seam route or something like that but i think that not only do you if you're a talented man defensive back i think that Mm -hmm. exemplifies kind of especially at this level um your readiness maybe for another level of football but i think it also exemplifies that you're going to have probably a better game i think to me you get in your receiver's head when you jam at the line at least that's Mm -hmm. how i've always read it it's the best way i think to throw someone off their game is you know because they they don't want it like you're saying they don't want to do the hand fights they want to Jet, they want to zoom by get the jet jet yeah. by you you know every receiver interview i've ever had that's all they say it's like get yeah the they want the free release they want yep. they want space that's where they thrive these receivers are are so good and the rules now you can't touch receivers sometimes you can't even touch <laughs> them at the line because they'll call a penalty <laughs> they, they, they're built for for offense they're built for points so if if you can if you can uh take that space away it it'll allow you to play good defense good corner play and two of our corners got a chance to to be on nfl camps and and i think that kind of goes back as we play an nfl style of defense and it we play tight coverage and that's that's what scouts look for Mm -hmm. yeah you talk about nfl camps and say mike vrabel gave your gave a few your guys some good looks too it was Mm -hmm. uh, i was i was i think some of us were surprised like oh now they gotta not only you're competing for a camp spot now you know but you're looking at the mall or secondary you know, looks like uh, some good evals. So, yeah, you know, and I'm not, and I'm not shocked as well. The signings you guys have had, I've, I've seen again, you know, knowing your family history and your specialty coming up into the spot you're in now, you know, all the CB signings, you know, secondary signings. I've, I was like, I think many of us went, yep, that, that, that tracks. And then of course there's still guys like you're talking returning possibly. I know, uh, mm-hmm. I know Boogie Roberts, it's not official, but he's already hinted he's coming back. Yeah, <laughs> in a very yeah, yeah. very nice yeah, social Boog, media type Boog way. sent me that he sent me that uh last week because i've been talking to him about coming back and and what his plans are and and i and i wanted him to to make sure that it was the right move for him to come back and and me and boog have a good relationship and he sent me that and i was like that's that's awesome that's that's gonna be great <laughs> so he put that out and i think people are excited about that because i think the league really likes boogie and the fans love him and you can see with the uh the the tv show that they did he was on it every week and he was one of the one of the the biggest stars of it yeah um and and i know that now boog is doing some doing some stuff in in the tv and 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 world like that so i I think i think for him coming back that's great he's a great football player he's a, a awesome personality awesome dude so it's great to have him coming back yeah, we, we can't wait to see him and, and hopefully a, a little bit healthier season. He gets a full season under his belt, too, because mm-hmm. I feel like that hindered some of his potential to get maybe more looks. I really hope he gets that shot and he gets a more full year of film under his belt so he can continue that dream. You know, yeah, uh, as well, I mean, he's got the education as we saw in the show. So that's yeah, great for sure. To have that, too, you know, getting that degree during the game or during the game season as well. So that's mm-hmm. nice. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, abs- absolutely. You know, <laughs> I can't imagine the. I can't imagine even going to school back right now and I got a full no hour question. Week job. No question. <laughs> I got to ask you, um, your coaching track has been, I think, it, I think it's almost con- kind of uh, fitting how you have gone. You were already in the AAF at one point. You know, mm-hmm. I know you, you, you have, of course, a background in, you know, with, with your family being a football family, you know, you, you have had, you've had had spurts where you're with Pittsburgh and also uh, with Cleveland for a little bit. Um, yep. You've been a defensive coordinator, but I mean, the Alliance, I feel, you know, it kind of exemplified for yourself. Maybe, you know, it's not just players. I think get opportunities. We don't talk enough. I think about the coaches uh, getting set opportunities with extra leagues. Uh, I mean, another example, Pat Hamilton, who gets talked to about this day about, getting that extra shot with the defenders. And now he's Mm -hmm. been talked as a very highly regarded, you know, coordinator and people, some people think he should have a job as a head coach. I mean, how do you feel about that system? Just giving your coaches, I mean, your assistants as well, more opportunities to maybe go elsewhere and not just be stuck in certain avenues or not have avenues. Yeah. So I'm I'm really glad you said something about Pep. Um, I know Pep, I worked with him in Cleveland in 2016. Um, He's incredible. Incredible football mind, very, very intelligent person, very smart or very, very good person. And 
in my opinion, he should be a head coach in the NFL. Not only a coordinator, he should be a head coach. And yeah, you're not the only one then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and it, it's a shame. It's honestly a shame that he has not been able to, that he's not looked upon as one of these candidates that's getting a head coaching job that has no head coaching experience in the NFL. I mean, you look at guys um, that have the guy in Denver right now, mm -hmm. the guy in Green Bay, Cincinnati, Miami. All those guys never had head coaching experiences before. Um, and was what what was their track record before? I mean, I know that Hackett worked with Aaron Rodgers. Right. Um, what's his name up in uh, – was with McVay. And that's a lot of things. The guys were at McVay. But mm -hmm. Pep tutored Andrew Luck um, and in college and the NFL. Like, Andrew Luck. If, if he doesn't have the injuries that he has, he's potentially one of the best ever. Like, yeah, we're still talking about him to this day. If, if he doesn't have yeah. any of the issues, uh, injury yeah. wise. So I think it's a shame what that pep doesn't have a, a chance to be a head coach in the NFL because he, he deserves it. I think he's incredible. Um, but I think as far as the, the, the USFL, um, and the, the spring leagues, I think it is, it's, it's, it's a developmental league. That's what the, the USFL is pushing. Um, in, in my opinion, if you want to develop the players, develop the coaches, um, like Pep was able to have a chance. I mean, shoot, I know the new Orleans job is open. I would like to get an interview for that job. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm a young coach and there are guys in the NFL. Like I said, the guy in green Bay, the guy in Cincinnati, the guy in Miami, the guy in Denver that have had no head coaching experience, but are given opportunities to be head coach in the NFL. If you're the USFL, you have a, a opening in one of your teams and you have a young coordinator who shoot, maybe you guys give me the chance to be the new Orleans head coach. Maybe in five years, I'm a super bowl winning head coach and I can come back and be like, yeah, the USFL gave me the opportunity and develop me. And that's right. what they say they want to be about as far as development. So, I mean, this is a perfect opportunity to, to show that you want to develop coaches as, as well as players. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I, 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 and I stress, I don't think that gets talked about enough. I know Pep, Pep does, gets talked plenty, uh, of course. Um, but I mean, I feel like that still is almost an under discussed topic about these leagues because the players, obviously they're the focus, I think primarily, but you know, some of the coordinators, these, you know, like, you know, like yourself, you can, you can show off your skills and maybe make it to the next level too. You know, I mean, teams are evaluating and staffs are evaluating their talent needs on all phases. So, you know, I think that that's also valid, you know, next, mm -hmm. some people get, I think also passed over too that maybe, you know, timing wasn't there. Yeah. You have an Avenue right here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I, it's good. Good points all around, right there for yourself. A few, one other something with the defensive side. Um, I, I kind of want to bring up this because I think it's a, you talk a little bit about the uh, NFL esque type of discussion in a way. Um, I mean, you're, you're a defense coordinator. You've seen some of the just this past week. Um, this will date this interview, but I don't care. Um, roughing the passer calls. Um, <laughs> probably a contentious topic oh, for my. any defensive coordinator these days um how much more do you appreciate that the league gets to review personal foul calls i think that's great and an interesting thing about that is is my uncle my dad's brother was a nfl referee for i think about 20 years uh Fascinating. his name is is buddy horton uh he was a back judge for for about 20 years um so when there is questionable calls or if i have a question about officiating i'll always ask him because like, like i said and now he works for the league i think he does a uh he does development program for the nfl basically he's recruiting college officials and usfl officials for the nfl so he's okay. still very involved in it um but i think the league being able to review penalties is awesome because there were a few times there was one in our game against Philadelphia in week two. Um, okay. Ladarius Wiley 
a safety. I was with him at Vanderbilt. Mm-hmm. Um, he, I think, I think it was Trey Walker caught a, caught a ball across the middle and Ladarius hit him shoulder to the chest. They threw a flag. And I remember I was sitting in the box. I'm like, that's a bad call. That was a clean hit. He just hit him hard. And I was like, that's not a penalty. And they reviewed it and they took it off. And I was like, that's awesome. Although it would have been beneficial to us, to our team. But at the same time, I don't want to, I don't want to like get the benefit of a bad call. I want the call. I want the calls to be even. I want the calls to be right. I don't want to get the benefit of a bad call. Like, Tampa Bay did against Atlanta would Atlanta have won that game I don't know maybe well they would have had a chance to to at least possess the ball exactly. would they have won I don't know I, I who nobody knows but they would have had a chance that was a bad call and no amount of justification from anybody can tell me that was not a terrible call and and that's the other thing too that was Tom Brady at quarterback mm-hmm. you see other guys not getting that call so i mean do they officiate quarterbacks differently depending on who they are in my opinion yes in their opinion probably not but i mean it's my opinion so yeah i think i think the roughing the passer passer calls are awful the one in the monday night game too with chris jones when he took the ball i mean like i get player safety but at the same time you gotta let them play football because that it's a violent game it, it's a violent game with grown men playing that game. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it, it is violent. Oh, and, yeah. And you got to protect guys, but at the same time, like, you got to let them play because you, you can you, – the one on Tom Brady was just – it was a joke, an absolute joke. I, uh, I, as a Bears fan, I actually yelled I, – I yelled louder at that than I did losing to Minnesota because of <laughs> – how I felt it, you have precedent type of things with, I think, officiating that was one. I'm like, that's a, if that's a precedent, that's a bad precedent. You yeah. Know, that just, that just opens a can of worms for, okay, what's past what's roughing the passer. You know, yeah. if it's just a whip motion, well, there's a lot of roughing the passers that have been missed. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, nowadays you can't touch a quarterback. Like mm-hmm. an, an, another one that was bad was I think two weeks ago, it was Buffalo. Um, I can't remember who they're playing. It might've been Cincinnati mm-hmm. and the DB kind of, I think they were running almost like a speed option or something like that. But Josh Allen was directly facing the DB and the DB kind of gathered before he went and tackled him. And they didn't throw a flag until Josh Allen pointed at the official. And that's where the dangerous precedent comes in of these quarterbacks yelling at the officials to get a penalty but then they want to run fake slide and keep running. Well, if you do that, then you're going to slide and get hit. And I'm not saying yeah. anything dirty at all, because I don't believe in anything dirty at 1000%. I'm not saying that, but if you're going to run and fake slide the next time you slide and I hit you, then you can't get mad because you're putting on tape that, Oh, I might fake slide and, and go for a hundred yards. And that's all on sports center. But it's kind of like the gamesmanship. If you mm-hmm. are telling me you're going to slide, okay, I'll let you slide. If you're telling me you're going to go out of bounds, I'll let you go out of bounds. But the minute that you try to do something cute and fake slide or try to fake go out of bounds and get three extra yards, if you step out of bounds and I smoke you, that's on you. I might get a penalty, but that's on you because you're, in my opinion, that's taking away from the gamesmanship of football. And I don't like that personally Mm -hmm. yeah i can understand i i i just don't like the i just don't like gray area being judgment calls are something that it feels more and more have become part of the game um and i get it games getting faster it's more aggressive and violent yeah um but i feel there's avenues to do that which is actually that's why i bring this up because i like i felt last year and you know, I I definitely want to hear your thoughts on at least this, at least this, because to me the review speed was what was crucial to how this went down. You know, it, it's the speed of the game has to for fans work if you're doing reviews. And I felt for the personal foul ones, just with the dedicated command center, that speed of how the calls were decided, I think that also 
modifies how I feel towards it because I was overly positive at the end of the season. I was decently excited or enthused about that rule going in, but when they execute it where it's quick turnarounds, that just made me say, okay, why can't then let's just do this everywhere because that that justifies it if you can get a dedicated crew like that. Yeah, I, I think it was awesome. And the games that we weren't involved in that I was watching on TV that had like the review checks, I think it was awesome the transparency mm-hmm. of um Mike Pereira sitting there. He was like, All right, we're looking at this, explaining his decision making, communicating back to the referee on the field. And it did. It happened. It happened quickly. So I think that it's it's a great um, way to do it. And I think the other thing that was good about the way the USFL did it is it was Mike Pereira. It was all up to him. Mm -hmm. So it was consistent to him or at least, you know, okay, it's one person. It's not. Well, this game's got this person. This game's got this person. It's one guy. And I think the NFL has enough resources to you can have one guy that has all the tvs in one room and whatever i'm they have stuff like that already but i think it was great in my opinion this like you said the speed of it and just sometimes it's 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 not easy to be an official that's one of the hardest sure. jobs i'm not i'm not at all saying it's it's an easy job or anything like that i mean whatever eight ten years ago when they had the replacement officials you guys Everyone saw how bad that was. That oh, man. Seah- Seahawks and Green Bay game. It's not easy to be an official because it is. It's a fast game. Things happen like that. Um, but to be able to to have someone in a booth that, with the all seeing eye and and make sure that okay, no, this was this was not the correct call, or we missed this call, and we can we can make the right call. I think that's that's awesome. It's kind of like in in. European football or worldwide football, aka soccer, it's like VAR. Mm-hmm. And VAR is sometimes awful, but sometimes it's it's good to have. Handball, I mean, I don't like the the offsides to a to an inch or two, but I, I think that it, it it is good to an extent. And that's kind of what the what the officiating Mike Prayer thing is like. It's kind of like VAR to me. Mm-hmm. And you know, I'm thinking for yourself and you know, for the league, I mean. Hopefully you're like, you're talking, you know, his interpretation. So you can kind of go and maybe go back to your guys and say, all right, so this is how he's ruling it. You know, yeah. maybe you can bend it a little, don't go too crazy, but if it's ruling like this and it's not feeling like it's say the gamesmanship aspects being destroyed, you know, it's all like, it's just, it plays the strategy game is what I'm trying to get at. You know, you're trying mm-hmm. to For you sure. know, get the best out of your players, but also, you know, use the rule set to your best advantage to put the best defense out there as possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, 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 good point. Good points there. Honestly, um, Jaron, I want to thank you for joining me again. Much appreciated for the time. Um, looking forward to seeing what the Maulers are going to be capable of, of this year uh, before we go. Uh, and I just want to touch on this because it's recent day of news, you know, uh, the USFL is partnering with Hub Football, uh, the Don Yee led uh, football developmental camp program. Mm-hmm. Um, basically, going to be sharing scouting data. They're going to be essentially working hand in hand with the USFL. Uh, going to be a great player pipeline, it sounds like. I mean, for yourself, uh, how, how's it been? How much have you uh, learned about this uh, partnership so far uh, behind the scenes before this announcement was official? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't really heard anything about it um, until today. Okay. I think that it is it, it will be beneficial for the league. Um, it's just it's, it's another partnership to kind of get more information on players because right now our GM Lonnie is 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 working his tail off trying to trying to find prospects and and this that and other thing. But I think with this, I'm I'm assuming we'll have some sort of database that has by position by their information, their contact information, their agent information, so that we can kind of get a hold of those guys. Like, okay, we're looking for a tackle. Here's a list of 15 tackles with their measurables, where they went to school, where they played, if they played in any spring leagues and any European football, if they played in uh, the NFL at all camps, just that another thing, agent, Mm -hmm. phone number, all that injuries. Um, I think it'll just make make things, I guess, more more streamlined as far as uh, 
signing players and, and having a database of guys that, that the league can kind of work from instead of kind of just trying to pick and choose from here, from finding guys on, on Twitter that are hitting you up and stuff like that. Right. Right. Well, I'm definitely excited to dig more into this then. Um, and I, I think for yourselves, I mean, hub's been for many of those that are enthusiasts, it's been a, uh, very much, it's been very much a well-recognized positive, uh, organization that's bringing change and, you know, spotlight the players. So looking forward to see who they bring. And honestly, you bring the European portion of it up. That's one thing they've, that I think they've done a great job highlighting is, you know, foreign players, foreign, foreign uh, people to come in that, you know, maybe you don't get a look because you're outside of the States, but you know, a lot of people don't realize all the leagues that are outside of the U S and Canada yeah. that have some high quality guys that can maybe make the next step. Yeah, I got a, a buddy, uh, Mark Mattioli. I was with at Vanderbilt. Um, he's over in Europe now. He was uh, the head coach of the Parma Panthers in Italy yes. for a few years. Mm-hmm. Um, and his first season there, he, he took the team to the championship and won the championship there. Um, I believe he just just signed to be the head coach of a, a team in Paris, I want to say. The, 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 it's a new, a new team, I believe, in, in uh, the Europe. I'm I'm not positive about all the specifics, but sure. he just signed on to be a, the head coach there. Um, and I, like like you said, they they have talent over there. And being in college, we recruited internationally a little bit. Um, but it can be tough to try to get those guys over here based on age and just what is the talent level. I think the USFL with partnered with the hub can be a great great avenue for those guys to come over here, play American football in america with american rules to now if they want to take that step to the nfl if they have the talent and the the ability to do so i think that can be a an awesome avenue for for those international players absolutely i think so too i'm excited to see what all comes out for this and excited for you guys and every other team in the uh usfl it's just for you you know you want the best guys <laughs> yeah of course, the, of course yeah not not just best but better <laughs> of the best of the best is what yeah. you do. <laughs> uh jaron thank you very much for joining me uh wishing you the best yourself your staff uh kirby wilson and co with the maulers the best for 2023 and beyond looking forward to seeing the season kick off uh later this uh upcoming spring appreciate that thank you special thanks once again to defense coordinator jaron horton for joining the show, really just talking about all types of different subject matter uh, surrounding the Maulers, surrounding alt football. I mean, this this guy, you know, we talked about this in the mm-hmm. show, Stefan, and again, I can't say this enough um, in the fact that I do believe the coaching aspect of this doesn't always get talked about enough for opportunities. Uh, Pep Hamilton has kind of become, I think, the icon of like, modern alt football like hey if you can come here and take your shot you can elevate yourself anywhere because i mean Mm -hmm. you you saw it too too he loves pep um he wants pep to have a head coaching job i think there's as we said there's a lot of people between us Mm -hmm. me and jaron that is there's a lot of people that think he should get his shot here because he's kind of proven it at many levels at this point he knows what he's doing i mean hey we there is a vacancy in the in the usfl if uh if he wants to jump at that but i think he's got a pretty good position right now as it as it stands oh yeah hey if he did want to get back in that head coaching duty i'm sure fox and the usfl wouldn't stop him now i'll be honest yeah if i in in a perfect world i would be and if he was some Mm. reason available I would be, yeah. I'd be like, yeah, right, get right, that right. man on the phone. Do it right now. I imagine XFL fans also oh, like, yeah, get that man on the phone. I want him back with the defender. But it right is now. awesome seeing, right? <laughs> yeah, because you, we've talked to a lot of players on this show. Uh, and, you know, get, getting the, the coach's perspective, you you really kind of get that to that point that we were talking about early, early in the show that this isn't just for the players. This is also for the coaches, mm-hmm. the back, the backroom staffs, everything down to like the water boys and up. If you, you imagine, right? These are opportunities. You have the officials looking for a chance to go into the NFL. In fact, they're in the NFL pathway as it stands. And now we get the the firsthand look from the coach's perspective and from a team. Right. Like I said, call me crazy, but the Maulers are positioning themselves to, to not to 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 enhance where they were from last year. I mean, the number of signings, boom. You mentioned, we talked about this earlier, 
Kirby Wilson, I mean, he's getting ahead of all the other coaches being involved with hub football with that partnership and being <coughs> a supply chain of players. Kirby Wilson's got an eye on all of them right now. So, I mean, that, yeah. that bodes well for this team. Dude, I, he he and, com- and company over there, Jer- Jaron and especially Lonnie, I think th- Lonnie came in and, you know, he stepped in for uh, Chris Watt, who, as we heard on there, he went to Pittsburgh mm-hmm. for, for the Steelers, for a Steelers position, which how ironic that you go from the Maulers to the, Steel- <laughs> the Steelers that way um, and kind of go up, which, you know, congrats to him for that for that job. But Lonnie's coming in, and they they said you know he said it on there, and it's been basically insinuated. They are being aggressive. They want to get the best product. They want to wash the bad taste of last year out of their mouth, and show that hey, we have you know the coaching expertise and talent to where we can put together winning seasons and bring a quality mm-hmm. product to Pittsburgh in the near future too. Keep that in mind. You know that you have you want your city to embrace this team as well. You know and that you want the best product to also represent the USFL out there. This, it makes, I mean, this has definitely been a great start, you know, at least on paper for what the way they're wanting to do. And one thing I liked here and something that was in this interview, you know, Jaron was allowed to draft whoever he want, or at least mm-hmm. to put insight on whoever he wanted to draft in the USFL draft. Cause I think they look at each other, you know, as an independent, like, Hey, you are the defense coach, mm-hmm. defensive coach. Like you're the like buddy Ryan, of this team you get to handle this aspect this is your squad what do you want in this side that bad i'll give my input but this is your squad and kirby handles the offensive right. side of the squad so you know very much very much set up like that and of course so far something that the mallers have been really picking up a lot of secondary help you know jaron comes from a family with a background in in defensive back and you know secondary play as well as the coaching side of that so he definitely knows, and he, as in the interview you heard, he praises the fact that a lot of his guys were able to get up to that next level, especially folks that were his, mm-hmm. that were his, like his DBs last year, and they got to replace talent, and you know, a lot going on. You know, happy to bring him on and discuss. You know, he is uh, he was a joy to talk to, plenty of insight. Um, hopefully, we'll get to talk to him uh, come here later in the year. You know, maybe get a little insight of his on maybe just beginning of season or early season form. So we'll find out, keep him in touch. And, uh, hopefully I can, hopefully we can get to this year. Maybe have a few Maulers, uh, folks over on the show. I mean, that, if we're lucky. That's what I'm hoping too. Um, real quick, before we head into the, to the exit of the show, I have good news and bad news. Good news. What's that? Astros one, baby up to, Oh, <laughs> sign them up. You. I had a guy at work the other day because, you. you know, the Astros game was on during work and I, we were down in the first game quite a bit and came back yeah. a, in, in to end the game. Right. And I was watching and I said, I told the guy, I said, yeah, I mean, I'm just watching the Astros lose in the background while I'm working. And a couple of minutes later, I was like, well, good news. We won. And he said, uh, yeah, they probably <laughs> cheated. Get out of here. Get out of here. <laughs> now, here's the bad news, Zach. Here's the bad news. I don't know why, and I know it is only preseason. I get it. It's only preseason. But I don't know why I thought the Detroit Pistons might give me some hope this year. When I first looked at the score a few minutes ago, it was 20 to 8 with four minutes left in mm-hmm. the first quarter. And now it's 31 to 17 at the beginning of the second quarter they I don't think, and they're, yeah, they're, if you didn't know, they're on the losing end of that. They are on the, the yeah, bad I, side of that. <laughs> I don't, um, the bad news, the Pistons yeah, are winning, man. Right? Nah, that is not what <laughs> and I get. It's only preseason. Maybe they'll shock me. Maybe they'll surprise me, but, um, yeesh, yeesh. We'll see. I don't know. I don't know that I just had to chime in with those <laughs> things because Astros, come on, baby. What's well, like? What's well, like they say? I, I feel like this is kind of like an unofficial yeah. off-season, off-topic we're having here to end in a way. Because, because here's my thing. You know, as much as it's it is painful, as much as you have teams that might be be bad. You know, us being Bears and Lions fans together. You know, I always gotta go. Just look back at a nice little song and just say, you "Gotta have faith." No, Zach. I mean, I warned everybody <laughs> last week, Zach. I because I have friends, a lot of friends that like to gamble on sports, and they all said the Lions are looking pretty good this year. Their record doesn't show it, but look look at their offense. I said 
That's when you know not to bet on them. That's when you know. I said, take that. It's like it's it's just like stocks or anything else. Once somebody else starts talking about it, get out, get out as fast as you can. And you know what? They didn't heed my warnings. They didn't heed them. And then what happened? And I blame them that we got shut out. We not we didn't lose. We got <laughs> shut out, shellacked yes. in a game that we should have won. And, and you know, here's the thing, Zach. Here's here's the thing. I feel like I'm getting kicked while I'm down. I expect the Lions to lose a lot of games. That's fine. I get it. I concede. The one game that you couldn't lose, the one game that you should not lose was this game against our former coach. Stupid, 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 pencil in the ear, Matt Patricia. How dare he? How dare he get a def- Shut us out, Zach. How dare he? How dare they let him well, shut us out? Well, you know what's crazier is he's, he's the co-offensive coordinator. <sighs> I hate it. It's even weirder that way. Revenge game, and it's not even what he was expertised in when he came into Detroit. Oh, it's Think about such that. it's a spit in the face. And you know what? And here's the thing. You know what? This is the week now. This is the week that everybody lets their guards down on the Lions. And you this is my prediction. They're gonna win by like 40 or something ridiculous. Just some <laughs> stupid number. To where you're like, oh, maybe I was wrong. Uh, you know, that was a fluke. They're getting in their, they're getting their wheels grind, you know, back into motion, and then they're gonna lose like six straight. <laughs> Go figure. <sighs> for, for your, for your, for your sake, I, I think just getting giving you a win would be would be nice here. I mean, j- let's see here. You you guys are. Uh, who are you playing? Are you on a bye week this week? Actually, I think. Hey, that's yeah, the Lions' favorite week. You can't lose that yeah. one. <laughs> you can't lose as we say on inside the walls by the way you can't lose to the bye week unless you fold the team that is the only way you lose to a bye week is if the team doesn't exist after the bye week the lions are undefeated against the bye, oh my the bye for many uh, decades now they will get this win this somehow week. some way you watch they're gonna lose by one it's just gonna be a new game on the calendar <laughs> by zero to one You're like what <laughs> we We've been dodging yeah. taxes for years. I don't know if this will go on any further. Oh Fords, what are you Fords. doing? <laughs> Seriously, Dan Campbell, I want you to be the guy. That's the thing. Normally, Zach, normally right now I'd be like, get this guy out of here. Like with Matt Patricia, <laughs> you know, week one of the like the Matt Patricia era, I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to give him a shot. Week two, I was like, eh, I don't know. Week three, I was like, get him out of here. I don't like him. I know he thinks he... You, ah, the Bilicek coaching tree almost <laughs> never works out. So I don't know, but he really wanted to be Very rare. the Patriots in the Midwest. Wasn't going to happen, bro. The refs don't like Detroit. I will die on that statement. So anyway, I'm done talking about the Lions. I got to go check my blood pressure. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, I think I think that, I think that's a good end. <laughs> end boy. We'll simmer on down here, folks. Hey, everybody, thanks for tuning in for, for episode 34. Much Again, much sooner than we thought it would be. Good stuff, though, for the USFL this week. Plenty more is ahead. Uh, actually, that's the thing. USFL Fan Network's already saying that, you know, there's more stuff that they know about that, I guess, you know, remember, they're they're partnered mm-hmm. up with the league's Discord, so they're, they get, they're getting direct access right now. But they've been saying, you know, when we've talked with them, there's more on the horizon, even beyond this. So... Uh, yeah. that they know about right now. Like we asked, Hey, is, was, was the news that the, they, that you know about the hub? And they're like, that wasn't it. And it's like, Oh, I know. All yeah. right. We see you more news coming. <laughs> I'm excited. We got. USFL community. <laughs> Sign them up. Shiv- yeah. I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah. shivers right now. <laughs> I got shivers going on guys. Once again, here, just giving you a heads up. If you want more conversation with us, follow us on at USFL podcast, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you followed us all the way to the end of the video and you like what you heard or what you saw, if you want more from us, hit subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or on this YouTube page, you can hit that red button down below and click that bell icon, click the bell. It builds morale, as we say, not only for you, but for us too on the podcast and you get entered in, of course, that 5k giveaway for a custom USFL Jersey. Once we hit that number 
And then, of course, we're going to go beyond, as I have to put. Just saying, mm-hmm. it's going to happen. We will get there. It will be manifested into existence, people. And while you're at it again, check out Royal Retros. Code USFL Podcast. Save 10%. Get yourself a nice holiday gift while you're at it. I know it's kind of early for me to say that, but whatever. You got to shop. Go out and get yourself something nice for the spring football fan in your life. For my buddy here, the ref, I am Zach Conlon saying so long. Thanks for tuning in to episode 34. We'll catch you on the flip side for number 35 in the near future. Stay tuned. See you next time.